Section one of Two Supernatural Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Two Supernatural Stories by Percival Landon. Railhead. This story was told me in Rangoon by a man whose name, I think, was Torrens but I cannot remember very clearly, if indeed I ever knew. I hardly know anything about the man who told it, except that he was obviously convinced of its truth. He said that John Silbermeister told him the story himself, and I have no doubt that he did. So far as Torrens could recall the man, Silbermeister was an ordinary lanky man, of a singular directness of speech, and totally unable to see a joke, so, for that matter, was Torrens. He said that he had so far verified the story that at the date that Silbermeister mentioned, the N.P. railway would have reached Enderton. Nor is it apparent what motive there could be for Silbermeister lying in the matter. Torrens hadn't the imagination of a rickshaw waller, so it isn't his lie either. At any rate, I give it for what it is worth. Torrens was a little man who had taken up Christian science somewhat earnestly, a little beyond middle life. He was really a person of some importance on the railway, and I believe one of the company's most efficient servants. To listen to him sometimes, one would hardly believe that an accident could possibly occur on the railway, except as a mere delusion of the senses. I believe he died about two years after he told me the story and for his own sake I hope that he was able to maintain his Christian science doctrines to the end, for he had sore need of them. He died of cholera at Barmo in 1904. He had shown me round the curiosity shops of Rangoon, and with his help I had disentangled one or two interesting pieces of work from the mass of modern substitutes. It is unfair to call them forgeries, which fill up the curio shelves of Rangoon dealers. One of them was a little bronze serpent, which sat on its rounded tail and blinked at me with ruby eyes, as he told the story in the billiard room of the Strand. And I remember that the Calcutta boat was coming in from the Hastings Shoal at the time, and from time to time wailed like a lost spirit up the river. The heat was intense. They have not in Rangoon the mosquito antidotes to which one is used in India. One buzzing electric fan supplied the entire room, but its sphere of influence was entirely monopolized by a pair of German-Jewish diamond merchants and their wives. Some years ago, said Torrens, a man called Silbermeister came to me with excellent references and asked if there was any chance of his being employed on the new construction toward the Yunnan frontier. That was before Curzon had put a stopper on the whole project. I dare say Curzon was right. The railway to the northeast, both on this side and on the other side of the frontier, would have been extremely expensive and possibly impracticable. There are deep ravines, canyons, Silbermeister called them, across which our line had to be thrown to zigzag down to the bottom by reversing stations, and then up again, seemed to be the only possible means of crossing them, and with such enormous initial expenditure, it was doubtful whether the traffic would ever pay one per cent upon the capital. But we in Rangoon wanted to establish a definite connection with China, for political reasons, and if the Indian government had been willing to guarantee half the cost, the Burma Railway would have gone on with the business. Silbermeister, who had had a good deal of pioneer railway experience, would have been just the man for the job. While the matter was being decided in Calcutta, he remained here, and I saw a good deal of him. One evening Silbermeister told me this story, and, so far as I can judge the man at all, I should say that he was telling me the truth. Some years ago, when the big New York syndicate that, among thirty thousand others, employed Silbermeister, 
was pushing forward the construction of the n p railway in nebraska he was for about three months in charge of the railhead station at underton this was merely a solidly built wooden hut by the side of the line trains ran up to it and nominally carried passengers but as a matter of fact very few wanted to go farther than castleton a raw pioneer clump of houses which had already blossomed out into half a dozen stores seven hotels an electric generating shed and thirty or forty pretentiously named wooden houses beyond enderton the railway was at this time actually in course of construction the navvies were chiefly italian it was a difficult piece of work and about eight miles on matters had temporarily come to a standstill owing to a persistent subsidence along the edge of a small half-dry river on one thursday morning a piece of the embankment had given way and an italian workman had been killed this was a matter of no great importance all engineers know that their lives must be sacrificed to carry out any important work and on the whole the loss of life on this section of the n p line had been less than might have been expected there were the usual police guards in the navvies camp which contained between them three to four hundred workmen on a friday evening between six and seven o'clock silbermeister was sitting in his station-house at underton running over the week's wages account when a light engine ran up from castleton silbermeister was expecting the money with which to pay the navvy's weekly wages on the following day and a sub-inspector got off the footplate carrying a canvas bag which contained the money that was needed it was the usual week-end routine at the same time a couple of railway men took off the tender half a dozen large packing cases containing materials that had been requisitioned for the work and put them into the baggage room which composed one half of the station house the inspector ran through silbermeister's accounts initialled them as correct and then took a receipt for the money which he brought with him silbermeister proceeded to lock the money up in the safe in his own room and then checked the packing cases which had just been stored in the baggage room among these cases was a somewhat gruesome object a coffin sent up by the company from castleton in order that the victim of the late accident might be decently buried on sunday morning another receipt was signed for the cases and then the inspector told the engine driver he was ready to return before doing so however he turned to silbermeister and said do you feel quite safe here with all that money shall i leave you a man to spend the night here with you silbermeister shrugged his shoulders and with a smile declined the offer he said that the police looked after the navvy's camp and that he and his negro servant had spent many nights together at the station and that he had no fear of burglars he had he said his revolver beside him and the money would not remain with him more than that one night the two men shook hands and the inspector departed as he had come silbermeister then rechecked the books recounted the money saw that the doors were properly locked sent away his negro servant for the night the man had been getting the table ready for his supper while he was escorting the inspector back to the engine and after locking the door on to the platform occupied himself with some small duties now that his day's work was done there was no further possibility of being rung up from castleton so he took this opportunity of cleaning and readjusting the telegraph instrument which stood on a table by the wall and had not been working quite satisfactorily that morning for this purpose he disconnected the instrument and being a fairly skilled electrician though of an old school torrens said he did nearly all that was needed in a few minutes leaving the instrument as it was he lit a pipe and started to get ready his supper by this time the night had begun to fall in earnest 
and he lighted the kerosene lamp on the table. More from habit than from anything else, as he knew that he was not likely to need it, he also lighted a bull's-eye lantern which, on most evenings in the week, he took with him on his final rounds. Silbermeister then opened the cupboard and took down a loaf of bread, a tin of canned meat, and a pot of marmalade. His preparations for supper were simple. It was a cold night, and he meant to have some hot grog before turning in, so he lighted the spirit lamp and filled his kettle from a pitcher of water. While the water was boiling, he opened the tin of meat, cut himself a German slice of bread, and sat down to his meal. By this time the sun had entirely set, and only the last reflections from the dull western horizon still found their way through the windows. For a moment he looked out through the windows across the platform and the wide level waste beyond. There was not a living thing in sight, not a tree, hardly a bush. Then he shut up the house for the night and fastened the shutters. He sat down at the table for his meal, propped up a book underneath the lamp and made himself as comfortable as he could. The bully beef was not a very appetizing dish and it occurred to him that he had a bottle of sauce put away in a box at the side of the room. He got up, opened the box and, in order to find the sauce, turned out upon the floor with some noise most of the contents of the trunk. While doing so, he did not notice that the telegraph instrument on the farther table ticked out a short and sharp message. At least, it was only the last few strokes that attracted his attention. He turned from the box, before which he was kneeling, to listen, but the message had already stopped. Leaving the sauce undiscovered, he rose to his feet and muttered, I'm sure the thing was talking, and went across to the table to ask for a repetition from Castleton, only to discover, as he might have remembered, that he had himself disconnected the instrument while cleaning it. Dismissing the matter as an illusion, he returned to the box where the sauce was, and after a moment or two found what he wanted. He then resumed his seat at the table without thinking again of the telegraph instrument. He began his reading, and was in the middle of an engrossing sentence, when the telegraph instrument spoke again. This time there could be no mistake. Silbermeister, who knew that when he had left the machine three minutes before it was entirely disconnected, laid down his knife and fork, and listened like a man in a dream. There was no doubt about it. E. N. T. The signal for Enderton Station had been called up sharply, imperiously, unmistakably. He waited a moment, and then, in spite of the fact that he had not acknowledged the call, came the short message. He muttered the words as they were ticked out. Watch. The. Box. For one full minute Silbermeister sat immovable. There was no question of the fact, yet the man's common sense refused to believe in what his ears had heard. The room was dead silent except for the hissing of the spirit lamp which had just begun to boil. Silbermeister felt that he was the victim of some nightmare. He would not believe his own senses, and decided to test the thing once more. He rose from the table, went across to the instrument, and brought it bodily away from its position. He put it on the table in front of him next to the corned beef, and then, blowing out the spirit lamp, in order that the silence might be more intense, he resumed his seat and waited, hanging over it with every sense on the alert. The lamp lighted up his angular jaw and deep-set eyes, staring at the little contrivance of brass and wood. He had not to wait long. The instrument, with its connecting wires and plugs hanging over the side of his dinner-table, 
and still swinging to and fro beneath it once again called out his station e n t the sweat leapt to silbermeister's forehead but he made no sign it went on it was the same message short clear and beyond all doubt watch the box silbermeister passed a hand over his face and thought whatever the origin of this message was the message itself was unmistakable he reached for his bull's eye lantern saw it was burning well turned out the lamp on the table and rose silently he moved across to the door that separated his living room from the baggage room very quietly opened the door and waited one minute dragged its slow length along then two then three and still silbermeister stood in the darkness as motionless as the jamb of the door there was no sound inside or outside the station house so still was the silence that as silbermeister said a man could hear his blood circulating round the drum of his own ear rather a good expression torrens thought at last the tension was relieved there was a sound more like the sound of a gnawing mouse than anything else and silbermeister sank silently to his knee to listen more intently a touch which infinitesimal though it was could only have been made by iron upon iron betrayed the whole circumstance to him there was a man in the coffin and the man had so contrived the lid that he could get out of the coffin without attracting the notice of silbermeister till it was too late there was at the same moment the sound of a cautiously planted footstep on the platform outside silbermeister acted at once some of the cases of railway material that had been sent up that evening contained steel rods and they were as much as two men could carry into the room silbermeister was a strong man but he hardly knew how he managed unaided to drag down one of the packing cases and set it on top of the coffin with a crash that almost crushed it in the moment he had done so all pretence was at an end and the man within it shouted to his accomplice outside the answer was a blow on the door like a battering ram the packing case might hold down the man for some time yet so silbermeister leapt back into his living room to meet the new danger only to find the door on to the platform being battered through just above the bolt he picked up his revolver and in order to make sure there should be no attack from behind aimed at the coffin and pulled the trigger there was no response it was clear that treachery had been at work his black servant had seized the opportunity while silbermeister escorted the inspector to the engine of opening and emptying it an easy task as it was lying on the table there was no time to turn back to the baggage room seizing a small crowbar silbermeister had only just time to dash to the door through the hole in which his negro servant's arm was now thrusting itself feeling for the bolt he gripped the man's hand and pulled it into the room until the negro's armpit was forced up against the splintered hole in the door he struck at it with a crowbar and the negro screamed like a hare he struck again and again and again he hardly knows what happened during that awful minute he went on striking blindly and mechanically at what had suddenly become a man's sleeve in the baggage room he had just left the tremendous exertions of the imprisoned man were making the room resound and the packing case on the top of the coffin rocked to and fro silbermeister paid no attention he lost his head both lamps were now out and all he could do in the darkness was to go on hitting at what he held suddenly there was the whistle of an approaching engine 
no train was due until the following morning but silbermeister admitted that at that moment he hardly regarded anything as unusual a couple of armed men and the inspector leapt down on to the platform collared the negro servant who by that time was hanging half unconscious from the hole in the door and burst in just in time to intercept the man in the baggage room who had at last overturned the packing case above him and was crushing his way out through the lid of the coffin it was an extraordinary scene the inspector pulled the negro servant with his arm one pulp of splintered bone and blood into the room and thrust him roughly aside he fell without a moan into the corner the two men then brought the burglar into the living room between them silbermeister went back to the table sat down and put his head between his hands the inspector looked at him for a moment in amazement as he raised his head and said thank god after a pause he added why did you come the inspector answered your telegram caught us just before we left castleton again it was lucky wasn't it he added grimly silbermeister again raised his head from his hands and as if he heard nothing said but why did you come the inspector a trifle gravely said i told you your telegram just reached us in time there was another pause of ten seconds and then silbermeister pointed to the disconnected instrument and said once more why did you come his eyes turned in his head i sent no message and then he fell on the floor in a dead faint that is all i know about it that is the story that torrens told me and the story which undoubtedly torrens believed End of Railhead Section 2 of Two Supernatural Stories by Percival Landon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fernley Abbey, Part 1 Three years ago I was on my way out to the east, and as an extra day in London was of some importance, I took the Friday evening mail train to Brindisi, instead of the usual Thursday morning Marseille express. Many people shrink from the long forty-eight-hour train journey through Europe, and the subsequent rush across the Mediterranean on the nineteen-knot Isis or the Osiris. But there is really very little discomfort on either the train or the mail boat, and unless there is actually nothing for me to do, I always like to save the extra day and a half in London before I say goodbye to her for one of my longer tramps. This time, it was early, I remember, in the shipping season, probably about the beginning of September. There were few passengers, and I had a compartment in the P&O Indian Express to myself, all the way from Calais. All Sunday I watched the blue waves dimpling the Adriatic, and the pale rosemary along the cuttings the plain white towns with their flat roofs and their bold duomos and the grey-green gnarled olive orchards of apulia the journey was just like any other we ate in the dining car as often and as long as we decently could we slept after luncheon we dawdled the afternoon away with yellow-backed novels Sometimes we exchanged platitudes in the smoking room, and it was there that I met Alistair Colvin. Colvin was a man of middle height, with a resolute, well-cut jaw. His hair was turning grey, his moustache was sun-whitened, otherwise he was clean-shaven, obviously a gentleman, and obviously, also, a preoccupied man. He had no great wit. When spoken to, he made the usual remarks in the right way, and I dare say he refrained from banalities, only because he spoke less than the rest of us. 
most of the time he buried himself in the wagon-lit company's timetable but seemed unable to concentrate his attention on any one page of it he found that i had been over the siberian railway and for a quarter of an hour he discussed it with me then he lost interest in it and rose to go to his compartment but he came back again very soon and seemed glad to pick up the conversation again of course this did not seem to me to be of any importance most travellers by train become a trifle infirm of purpose after thirty-six hours rattling but colvin's restless way i noticed in somewhat marked contrast with the man's personal importance and dignity especially ill-suited was it to his finely made large hand with strong broad regular nails and its few lines as i looked at his hand i noticed a long deep and recent scar of ragged shape however it is absurd to pretend that i thought anything was unusual i went off at five o'clock on sunday afternoon to sleep away the hour or two that still had to be got through before we arrived at brindisi once there we few passengers transhipped our hand baggage verified our berths there were only a score of us in all and then after an aimless ramble of half an hour in brindisi we returned to dinner at the hotel international not wholly surprised that the town had been the death of virgil if i remember rightly there is a gaily painted hall at the international i do not wish to advertise anything but there is no other place in brindisi at which to await the coming of the mails and after dinner i was looking with awe at a trellis overgrown with blue vines when colvin moved across the room to my table he picked up il secolo but almost immediately gave up the pretence of reading it he turned squarely to me and said would you do me a favour one doesn't do favours to stray acquaintances on continental expresses without knowing something more of them than i knew of colvin but i smiled in a non-committal way and asked him what he wanted i wasn't wrong in part of my estimate of him he said bluntly will you let me sleep in your cabin on the osiris and he coloured a little as he said it now there is nothing more tiresome than having to put up with a stable companion at sea and i asked him rather pointedly surely there is room for all of us i thought that perhaps he had been partnered off with some mangy levantine and wanted to escape from him at all hazards colvin still somewhat confused said yes i am in a cabin by myself but you would do me the greatest favour if you would allow me to share yours this was all very well but besides the fact that i always sleep better when alone there had been some recent thefts on board these boats and i hesitated frank and honest and self-conscious as colvin was just then the mail train came in with a clatter and a rush of escaping steam and i asked him to see me again about it on the boat when we started he answered me curtly i am a member of white's and the beefsteak i smiled to myself as he said it but i remembered in a moment that the man if he were really what he claimed to be and i make no doubt that he was must have been sorely put to it before he urged the fact as a guarantee of his respectability to a total stranger at a brindisi hotel that evening as we cleared the red and green harbour lights of brindisi colvin explained this is his story in his own words when i was travelling in india some years ago i made the acquaintance of a youngish man in the woods and forests we camped out together for a week and i found him a pleasant companion john broughton was a light-hearted soul when off duty but a steady and capable man in any of the small emergencies that continually arise in that department he was liked and trusted by the natives and his future was well assured in government service when a fair-sized estate was unexpectedly left to him and he joyfully shook the dust of the indian plains from his feet 
and returned to england for five years he drifted about london i saw him now and then we dined together about every eighteen months and i could trace pretty exactly the gradual sickening of broughton with a merely idle life he then set out on a couple of long voyages returned as restless as before and at last told me that he had decided to marry and settle down at his place fernley abbey which had long been empty he spoke about looking after the property and standing for his constituency in the usual way he was quite happy and full of information about his future among other things i asked him about fernley abbey he confessed that he hardly knew the place the last tenant a man called clark had lived in one wing for fifteen years and seen no one he had been a miser and a hermit it was the rarest thing for a light to be seen at the abbey after dark only the barest necessities of life were ordered and the tenant himself received them at the side door his one half-caste man-servant after a month's stay in the house had abruptly left without warning and had returned to the southern states one thing broughton complained bitterly about clark had wilfully spread the rumour among the villagers that the abbey was haunted and had even condescended to play childish tricks with spirit lamps and salt in order to scare trespassers away at night he had been detected in the act of this tomfoolery but the story spread and no one said broughton would venture near the house except in broad daylight the hauntedness of thurnley abbey was now he said with a grin part of the gospel of the countryside but he and his young wife were going to change all that would i propose myself any time i liked i of course said i would and equally of course intended to do nothing of the sort without a definite invitation the house was put in thorough repair though not a stick of the old furniture and tapestry were removed floors and ceilings were relaid the roof was made water-tight again and the dust of half a century was scoured out he showed me some photographs of the place it was called an abbey though as a matter of fact it had been only the infirmary of the long-vanished abbey of Closter, some five miles away the larger part of this building remained as it had been in pre-reformation days but a wing had been added in jacobean times and that part of the house had been kept in something like repair by mr clark he had in both the ground and the first floors set a heavy timber door strongly barred with iron in the passage between the earlier and the jacobean parts of the house and had entirely neglected the former so there had been a good deal of work to be done broughton whom i saw in london two or three times about this time made a deal of fun over the positive refusal of the workmen to remain after sundown even after the electric light had been put into every room nothing would induce them to remain though as broughton observed electric light was death on ghosts the legend of the abbey's ghosts had gone far and wide and the men would take no risks on the whole though nothing of any sort or kind had been conjured up even by their heated imaginations during their five months work upon the abbey the belief in the ghosts was rather strengthened than otherwise in Thernley because of the men's confessed nervousness and the local tradition declared itself in favour of the ghost of an immured nun good old nun said broughton i asked him whether in general he believed in the possibility of ghosts and rather to my surprise he said that he couldn't say he entirely disbelieved in them a man in india had told him one morning in camp that he believed that his mother was dead in england as her vision had come to his tent the night before he had not been alarmed but had said nothing and the figure vanished again as a matter of fact the next possible dock waller brought a telegram announcing the mother's death 
there the thing was said broughton my own idea said he is that if a ghost ever does come in one's way one ought to speak to it i agreed little as i knew of the ghost world and its conventions i had already remembered that a spook was in honour bound to wait to be spoken to it didn't seem much to do and i felt that the sound of one's own voice would at any rate reassure one's self as to one's wakefulness but there are few ghosts outside europe few that is that a white man can see and i had never been troubled with any however as i have said i told broughton that i agreed so the wedding took place and i went to it in a tall hat which i bought for the occasion and the new mrs broughton smiled very nicely at me afterwards as it had to happen i took the orient express that evening and was not in england again for nearly six months just before i came back i got a letter from broughton he asked if i could see him in london or come to thurnley as he thought i should be better able to help him than anyone else he knew his wife sent a nice message to me at the end so i was reassured about at least one thing i wrote from budapest that i would come and see him at thurnley two days after my arrival in london and as i sauntered out of the pannonia into the kerepeshi ut to post my letters i wondered of what earthly service i could be to broughton i had been out with him after tiger on foot and i could imagine few men better able at a pinch to manage their own business however i had nothing to do so after dealing with some small accumulations of business during my absence i packed a kit bag and departed to euston i was met by a trap at thurnley road station and after a drive of nearly seven miles we echoed through the sleepy streets of thurnley village into which the main gates of the park thrust themselves splendid with pillars and spread eagles and tom-cats rampant atop of them from the gates a quadruple avenue of beech trees led inwards for a quarter of a mile beneath them a neat strip of fine turf edged the road and ran back until the poison of the dead beech leaves had killed it under the trees there were many wheel tracks on the road and a comfortable little pony trap jogged past me laden with a country parson and his wife and daughter evidently there was some garden party going on at the abbey the road dropped away to the right at the end of the avenue and i could see the abbey across a wide pasturage and a broad lawn thickly dotted with guests the end of the building was plain it must have been almost mercilessly austere when it was first built but time had crumbled the edges and toned the stone down to an orange lichened grey wherever it showed behind its curtain of magnolia jasmine and ivy farther on was the three-storied jacobean house plain and handsome there had not been the slightest attempt to adapt the one to the other but the kindly ivy had glossed over the touching point there was a tall flash in the middle of the building surmounting a small bell tower behind the house there rose the mountainous verdure of spanish chestnuts all the way up the hill broughton had seen me coming from afar and walked across from his other guests to welcome me before turning me over to the butler's care this man was sandy-haired and rather inclined to be talkative he could however answer hardly any questions about the house he had he said only been there three weeks mindful of what broughton had told me i made no inquiries about ghosts though the room into which i was shown might have justified anything it was a very large low room with oak beams projecting from the white ceiling every inch of the walls including the doors was covered with tapestry and a remarkably fine italian four-post bed heavily draped added to the darkness and dignity of the place all the furniture was old well made and dark underfoot there was a plain green pile carpet 
the only new thing about the room except the electric light fittings and the jugs and basins even the looking-glass on the dressing-table was an old pyramidal venetian glass set in heavy repousse frame of tarnished silver after a few minutes cleaning up i went downstairs and out upon the lawn where i greeted my hostess the people gathered there were of the usual country type all anxious to be pleased and roundly curious as to the new master of the abbey rather to my surprise and quite to my pleasure i rediscovered glenham whom i had known well in old days in barotseland he lived quite close as he remarked with a grin i ought to have known but he added i don't live in a place like this he swept his hand to the long low lines of the abbey in obvious admiration and then to my intense interest muttered beneath his breath thank god he saw that i had overheard him and turning to me said decidedly yes thank god i said and i meant i wouldn't live at the abbey for all broughton's money but surely i demurred you know that old clark was discovered in the very act of setting light to his bugaboos glenham shrugged his shoulders yes i know about that but there is something wrong with the place still all i can say is that broughton is a different man since he has lived here i don't believe that he will remain much longer but you're staying here well you'll hear all about it tonight there's a big dinner i understand the conversation turned off to old reminiscences and glenham soon after had to go before i went to dress that evening i had twenty minutes talk with broughton in his library there was no doubt that the man was altered gravely altered he was nervous and fidgety and i found him looking at me only when my eye was off him i naturally asked him what he wanted of me i told him i would do anything i could but that i couldn't conceive what he lacked that i could provide he said with a lustreless smile that there was however something and that he would tell me the following morning it struck me that he was somehow ashamed of himself and perhaps ashamed of the part he was asking me to play however i dismissed the subject from my mind and went up to dress in my palatial room as i shut the door a draught blew out the queen of sheba from the wall and i noticed that the tapestries were not fastened to the wall at the bottom i have always held very practical views about spooks and it has often seemed to me that the slow waving in firelight of loose tapestry upon a wall would account for ninety-nine per cent of the stories one hears and certainly the dignified undulation of this lady with her attendants and huntsmen one of whom was untidily cutting the throat of a fallow deer upon the very steps on which king solomon a grey-faced flemish nobleman with the order of the golden fleece awaited his fair visitor gave colour to my hypothesis nothing much happened at dinner the people were very much like those of the garden party after the ladies had gone i found myself talking to the rural dean he was a thin earnest man who at once turned the conversation to old clark's buffooneries but he said mr broughton had introduced such a new and cheerful spirit not only into the abbey but he might say into the whole neighbourhood that he had great hopes that the ignorant superstitions of the past were from henceforth destined to oblivion thereupon his other neighbour a portly gentleman of independent means and position audibly remarked amen which damped the rural dean and we talked of partridges past partridges present and pheasants to come at the other end of the table broughton sat with a couple of his friends red-faced hunting men once i noticed that they were discussing me but i paid no attention to it at the time 
I remembered it a few hours later. End of section two. Section three of Two Supernatural Stories by Percival Landon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fernley Abbey, Part Two. By eleven, all the guests were gone, and Broughton, his wife, and I were alone together under the fine plaster ceiling of the Jacobean drawing room. Mrs. Broughton talked about one or two of the neighbours and then, with a smile, said that she knew I would excuse her, shook hands with me, and went off to bed. I am not very good at analysing things, but I felt that she talked a little uncomfortably, and with a suspicion of effort, smiled rather conventionally, and was obviously glad to go. These things seemed trifling enough to repeat, but I had throughout the faint feeling that everything was not square. Under the circumstances, this was enough to set me wondering what on earth the service could be that I was to render, wondering also whether the whole business were not some ill-advised jest in order to make me come down from London for a mere shooting party. Broughton said little after she had gone, but he was evidently labouring to bring the conversation round to the so-called haunting of the abbey. As soon as I saw this, of course I asked him directly about it. He then seemed at once to lose interest in the matter. There was no doubt about it. Broughton was somehow a changed man, and to my mind he had changed in no way for the better. Mrs. Broughton seemed no sufficient cause. He was clearly very fond of her, and she of him. I reminded him that he was going to tell me what I could do for him in the morning, pleaded my journey, lighted a candle, and went upstairs with him. At the end of the passage leading into the old house, he grinned weakly and said, Mind, if you do see a ghost, talk to it. You said you would. He stood irresolutely a moment, and then turned away. At the door of his dressing room he paused a moment, I'm here, he called out, if you should want anything. Good night. And he shut his door. I went along the passage to my room, undressed, switched on a lamp beside my bed, read a few pages of the jungle book, and then, more than ready for sleep, switched the light off and went fast asleep. Three hours later I woke up. There was not a breath of wind outside. It was so silent that my ears found employment in listening for the throbbing of the blood within them. There was not even a flicker of light from the fireplace. As I lay there, an ash tinkled slightly as it cooled, but there was hardly a gleam of the dullest red in the grate. An owl cried among the silent Spanish chestnuts on the slope outside. I idly reviewed the events of the day, hoping that I should fall off to sleep again before I reached dinner, but at the end I seemed as wakeful as ever. There was no help for it. I must read my jungle book again till I felt ready to go off, so I fumbled for the pair at the end of the cord that hung down inside the bed, and I switched on the bedside lamp. The sudden glory dazzled me for a moment. I felt under my pillow for my book with half-shut eyes. Then, growing used to the light, I happened to look down to the foot of my bed. I can never tell you what really happened then. Nothing I could ever confess in the most abject words could even faintly picture to you what I felt. I know that my heart stopped dead and my throat shut automatically. In one instinctive movement I crouched back up against the headboards of the bed, staring at the horror. The movement set my heart going again, and the sweat dripped from every pore. I am not a particularly religious man, 
but i had always believed that god would never allow any supernatural appearance to present itself to man in such a guise and in such circumstances that harm either bodily or mental could result to him i can only tell you that at that moment both my life and my reason rocked unsteadily on their seats the other osiris passengers had gone to bed only he and i remained leaning over the starboard railing which rattled uneasily now and then under the fierce vibration of the over-engined mail-boat far over there were the lights of a few fishing smacks riding out the night and a great rush of white combing and seething water fell out and away from us overside at last colvin went on leaning over the foot of my bed looking at me was a figure swathed in a rotten and tattered veiling this shroud passed over the head but left both eyes and the right side of the face bare it then followed the line of the arm down to where the hand grasped the bed end the face was not that entirely of a skull though the eyes and the flesh of the face were totally gone there was a thin dry skin drawn tightly over the features and there was some skin left on the hand one wisp of hair crossed the forehead it was perfectly still i looked at it and it looked at me and my brains turned dry and hot in my head i had still got the pair of the electric lamp in my hand and i played idly with it only i dared not turn the light out again i shut my eyes only to open them in a hideous terror the same second the thing had not moved my heart was thumping and the sweat cooled me as it evaporated another cinder tinkled in the grate and a panel creaked in the wall my reason failed me for twenty minutes or twenty seconds i was able to think of nothing else but this awful figure till there came hurtling through the empty channels of my senses the remembrance that broughton and his friends had discussed me furtively at dinner the dim possibility of it being a hoax stole gratefully into my unhappy mind and once there one's pluck came creeping back along a thousand tiny veins my first sensation was one of blind unreasoning thankfulness that my brain was going to stand the trial i am not a timid man but the best of us needs some human handle to steady him in time of extremity and in this faint but growing hope that after all it might be only a brutal hoax i found the fulcrum that i needed at last i moved how i managed to do it i cannot tell you but with one spring towards the foot of the bed i got within arm's length and struck out one fearful blow with my fist at the thing it crumbled under and my hand was cut to the bone with this sickening revulsion after my terror i dropped half fainting across the end of the bed so it was merely a foul trick after all no doubt the trick had been played many a time before no doubt broughton and his friends had had some bet among themselves as to what i should do when i discovered the gruesome thing from my state of abject terror i found myself transported into an insensate anger i shouted curses upon broughton i dived rather than climbed over the bed-end on to the sofa i tore at the robed skeleton how well the thing had been carried out i thought i broke the skull against the floor and stamped upon its dry bones i flung the head away under the bed and rent the brittle bones of the trunk in pieces i snapped the thin thigh bones across my knee and flung them in different directions the shin bones i set up against a stool and broke with my heel 
i raged like a berserker against the loathly thing and stripped the ribs from the backbone and slung the breastbone against the cupboard my fury increased as the work of destruction went on i tore the frail rotten veil into twenty pieces and the dust went up over everything over the clean blotting paper and the silver inkstand at last my work was done there was but a raffle of broken bones and strips of parchment and crumbling wool then picking up a piece of the skull it was the cheek and temple bone of the right side i remember i opened the door and went down the passage to broughton's dressing-room i remember still how my sweating pyjamas clung to me as i walked at the door i kicked and entered broughton was in bed he had already turned the light on and seemed shrunken and horrified for a moment he could hardly pull himself together then i spoke i don't know what i said only i know that from a heart full and overfull with hatred and contempt spurred on by shame of my own recent cowardice i let my tongue run on he answered nothing i was amazed at my own fluency my hair still clung lankily to my wet temples my hand was bleeding profusely and i must have looked a strange sight broughton huddled himself up at the head of the bed just as i had still he made no answer no defence he seemed preoccupied with something besides my reproaches and once or twice moistened his lips with his tongue but he could say nothing though he moved his hands now and then just as a baby who cannot speak moves his hands at last the door into mrs broughton's room opened and she came in white and terrified what is it what is it oh in god's name what is it she cried again and again and then she went up to her husband and sat on the bed and the two faced me in speechless terror i told her what the matter was i spared her husband not a word for her presence there yet he seemed hardly to understand i told the pair that i had spoiled their cowardly joke for them broughton looked up i have smashed the foul thing into a hundred pieces i said broughton licked his lips again and his mouth worked by god i shouted it would serve you right if i thrashed you within an inch of your life i will take care that not a decent man or woman of my acquaintance ever speaks to you again and there i added throwing the broken piece of the skull upon the floor beside his bed there is a souvenir for you of your damned work to-night broughton saw the bone and in a moment it was his turn to frighten me he squealed like a hare caught in a trap he screamed and screamed till mrs broughton almost as terrified as i held on to him and coaxed him like a child to be quiet but broughton and as he moved i thought that ten minutes ago i perhaps looked as terribly ill as he did thrust her from him and scrambled out of the bed on to the floor and still screaming put out his hand to the bone it had blood on it from my hand he paid no attention to me whatever in truth i said nothing this was a new turn indeed to the horrors of the evening he rose from the floor with the bone in his hand and stood silent he seemed to be listening time time perhaps he muttered and almost at the same moment fell at full length on the carpet cutting his head against the fender the bone flew from his hand and came to rest near the door i picked broughton up haggard and broken with blood over his face he whispered hoarsely and quickly listen listen we listened 
after ten seconds utter quiet i seemed to hear something i could not be sure but at last there was no doubt there was a quiet sound as of one moving along the passage little regular steps came towards us over the hard oak flooring broughton moved to where his wife sat white and speechless on the bed and pressed her face into his shoulder then the last thing that i could see as he turned the light out he fell forward with his own head pressed into the pillow of the bed something in their company something in their cowardice helped me and i faced the open doorway of the room which was outlined fairly clearly against the dimly lighted passage i put out one hand and touched mrs broughton's shoulder in the darkness but at the last moment i too failed i sank on my knees and put my face in the bed only we all heard the footsteps came to the door and there they stopped the piece of bone was lying a yard inside the door there was a rustle of moving stuff and the thing was in the room mrs broughton was silent i could hear broughton's voice praying muffled in the pillow i was cursing my own cowardice then the steps moved out again on the oak boards of the passage and i heard the sounds dying away in a flash of remorse i went to the door and looked out there at the end of the corridor was a small bowed figure in a grey veil i knew it only too well but this time there was a pathos in the drooped head that left me standing with my forehead bowed in shame against the jam of the door you can turn the light on i said and there was an answering flare there was no bone at my feet mrs broughton had fainted broughton was almost useless and it took me ten minutes to bring her to broughton only said one thing worth remembering for the most part he went on muttering prayers but i was glad afterwards to recollect that he had said that thing he said in a colourless voice half as a question half as a reproach you didn't speak to her we spent the remainder of the night together mrs broughton actually fell off into a kind of sleep before dawn but she suffered so horribly in her dreams that i shook her into consciousness again never was dawn so long in coming three or four times broughton spoke to himself mrs broughton would then just tighten her hold on his arm but she could say nothing as for me i can honestly say that i grew worse as the hours passed and the light strengthened the two violent reactions had battered down my steadiness of view and i felt that the foundations of my life had been built upon the sand i said nothing and after binding up my hand with a towel i did not move it was better so they helped me and i helped them and we all three knew that our reason had gone very near to ruin that night at last when the light came in pretty strongly and the birds outside were chattering and singing we felt that we must do something yet we never moved you might have thought that we should particularly dislike being found as we were by the servants yet nothing of the kind mattered a straw and an overpowering listlessness bound us as we sat until chapman broughton's man actually knocked and opened the door none of us moved broughton speaking hardly and stiffly said chapman you can come back in five minutes chapman was a discreet man but it would have made no difference if he had carried his news to the room at once we looked at each other and i said i must go back i meant to wait outside till chapman returned i simply dared not re-enter my bedroom alone 
Broughton roused himself and said that he would come with me. Mrs. Broughton agreed to remain in her own room for five minutes, if the blinds were drawn up and all the doors left open. So Broughton and I, leaning stiffly one against the other, went down to my room. By the morning light that filtered past the blinds we could see our way, and I released the blinds. There was nothing wrong in the room from end to end, except smears of my own blood on the bed, on the sofa, and on the carpet, where I had torn the thing to pieces. Colvin had finished his story. There was nothing to say. Seven bells stuttered out from the forecastle, and the answering cry wailed through the darkness. I took him downstairs. Of course, I am much better now, but it is a kindness of you to let me sleep in your cabin. End of section three. And end of Two Supernatural Stories by Percival Landon. Thank you for listening.